Once in a while, a great scientist comes along who notices a pattern in nature that others may have completely missed. For example, Isaac Newton realized that the forces acting on a fired cannonball are the same as that on the moon orbiting the Earth. Ernest Rutherford was another such person. When he realized that atoms have a heavy nucleus, he hypothesized that the way the moon orbits the Earth is the same as the way the electron orbits the nucleus of atoms. Newton was right. Rutherford, we now know, was wrong. An atom would not look anything like this. Yet we still use the Rutherford model to depict the way atoms look. It's the most familiar image we have of the atom. A real atom would look shockingly different from anything like this, and it would definitely not be mostly empty space as you have been told. What does an atom actually look like? And how did we determine that? Why doesn't an electron just fall to the nucleus since they attract each other so strongly? Why can't we squeeze atoms together? The answer requires us to look deeper into the meaning of quantum mechanics. Why do we trust quantum mechanics anyway? And how did we arrive at this revelation, perhaps the most accurate and proven theory in science? The answer is coming up right now. In 1911, Ernest Rutherford proposed a planetary model of the atom. According to the model, the solar system and the atom were almost identical. Just like the moon is held in orbit around the Earth due to gravity, the negatively charged electron was held in orbit around a positively charged nucleus. The attractive force was electromagnetism instead of gravity in the case of the atom. This seemed to make sense because Isaac Newton's laws of universal gravitation was almost identical to Coulomb's law for electric force. This was beautiful, a fantastic symmetry of nature. But alas, it was too good to be true. One big problem is that when electrons are accelerated, as they would be when constantly changing direction traveling in circular orbits, they create electromagnetic waves according to Maxwell's equations. This means that photons would be constantly radiated from the electron, causing it to lose energy. It would radiate a rainbow of colors getting bluer and more purplish as the electron came closer and closer to the nucleus until it collapsed into it. So using classical laws for the atom did not work if you presumed the Rutherford model. A bold new step was needed, but little did Rutherford realize that 11 years earlier in 1900, Max Planck had already made this step by showing that energy of photons was quantized. Planck's theory had shown that matter emitted only discrete amounts of radiation with energy E proportional to the frequency F, the proportionality constant H being Planck's constant. A young scientist by the name of Niels Bohr came along and combined Rutherford's model and Planck's theory to hypothesize that the electron could exist in certain special orbits without radiating energy. How did he come up with this? Well, what Bohr noticed is that Planck's constant had units of angular momentum. So he hypothesized that only those orbits would be allowed where the angular momentum of the electron is quantized based on Planck's constant. And he guessed that the lowest orbit would have the momentum of h over 2 pi, where the 2 pi comes from the geometry of circular orbits. And any orbit could exist as long as it was an integer multiple of this number. So the next orbit would be 2 times h over 2 pi, and then 3 times for the next one, and so on. And Bohr predicted that the electrons would only radiate or absorb energy when these electrons jumped from one orbit to another. But Bohr could not explain why electrons would not emit photons all the time, or why these special orbits should exist in the first place. But presuming he was right, you could find the size of the orbit of the electron using Coulomb's law. It turns out that the radius of the lowest orbit would be 0.529 times 10 to the negative 10 meters, about half an angstrom. So now we knew the size of the atom, which had been a mystery in the past. Knowing this, the energy emitted by the electron as it changes orbits could be calculated, and lo and behold, observations from energy emissions confirmed these calculations. So Bohr's model was right. Since this model predicted values that could be verified, it was thought that this was it. This must be what atoms really look like. The problem was nobody knew why Bohr was right. So this was probably not the final answer. Then along came a brilliant French scientist by the name of Louis de Broglie. He said, look, if a particle has a momentum and it has a wavelength associated with it because of Planck's constant, then an electron is probably a wave. 
This required a huge philosophical leap because here was a guy suggesting that solid matter, things that we can see and feel on a macro scale, was composed of waves. Matter was somehow a particle and wave at the same time. De Broglie suggested that electrons can only exist in orbits where their waves interfere constructively, and that can only happen if the circumference of the orbit is equal to the wavelength, or twice the wavelength, or three times the wavelength, or any integer times the wavelength. This made sense and explained why orbits would be at the radii that they are, something that Bohr could not do. The Bohr model was looking more and more legit, but there were still many questions. What is the nature of these waves? And how and why do they exist? A crucial piece of the puzzle was solved by Austrian physicist Erwin Schrödinger. He said, look guys, if it's a wave, it can exist anywhere in three-dimensional space. And he formulated the rules to describe the behavior of these waves. The rules are encompassed in the Schrodinger equation, which became arguably the most important equation in quantum mechanics. The rules were so spectacularly successful in making predictions that no one could really dispute it. Schrodinger's equation could describe the hydrogen atom with more detail and precision than the Bohr model, but it could also describe all the other atoms in the periodic table which the Bohr model could not. It was truly a revelation. This was not Newtonian mechanics anymore, but a new kind of mechanics based on the quantum revolution started by Max Planck. It was quantum mechanics. And Schrodinger's equation containing the wave function of atoms is the one critical piece of information that we need to determine what an atom most likely actually looks like. But why do we even have to guess? Why don't we just settle the debate by just looking inside any material to see what these pesky little things actually look like? The problem is that in order to be seen, the object has to be large enough to reflect light. But the largest atom is a thousand times smaller than the wavelength of visible light. So visible light goes right through the atoms. It can't really be seen because no light is reflected back. What about using shorter wavelength light like x-rays? The problem is that short wavelength light carries so much energy that it interacts with the electron, changing it. This is one of the consequences of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says that the range of an electron's position times the range of its momentum cannot be below a certain constant, h over 4 pi. We cannot say where the electrons are or how fast they're moving at the same time, so we can't draw a picture with a little electron in one place sitting on a circular orbit. So we have to take our best guess based on what the wave equation tells us. And what it tells us is that the electron forms a cloud around the nucleus. The shape of the cloud is governed by the wave function. It's called a wave function because the quantum wave equation resembles the equation for a classical wave. The cloud represents the probable position of the electron if you were to measure it. And this cloud exists everywhere from the nucleus to very far away from the nucleus. The volume of the atom is thus definitely not empty. It's filled everywhere with a cloud of electrons. We can use the Schrodinger wave equation to find the electron probability. This plot shows the probability of finding an electron at various distances from the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. The highest probability occurs at, wouldn't you know it, 0.529 times 10 to the negative 10 meters, which is exactly the radius calculated by Bohr. So the most probable radius obtained from quantum mechanics is identical to the radius calculated by classical mechanics. In Bohr's model, however, the electron was assumed to be at this distance all the time, whereas in the Schrodinger model, it is at this distance only some of the time. It has the highest probability of being at this radius, but it could be elsewhere too. The difference is due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and the fact that the electron acts like a 3D wave. And the same wave equation tells us that the nucleus of atoms, which in the case of the hydrogen atom is a proton, is also a cloud. But the extent of the proton cloud is much smaller than the electron cloud because it is much more massive. So if you look at the uncertainty equation, you can see that the extent of the delta x would be much smaller given a large m in order to satisfy the inequality. The proton cloud is so small, in fact, that if the electron cloud was the size of Michigan Stadium, the largest sports stadium in America, which seats about 110,000 people, the proton would be the size of a marble at the 50-yard line. The electron cloud is about 100,000 times larger than the proton cloud. So the idea of discrete spherical protons and neutrons in the nucleus, or electrons orbiting them, is really fiction. It's good for showing kids in classrooms, 
but not for students of quantum mechanics. Let me clarify, though, that you would never actually see a hydrogen atom in this state because the act of seeing it would necessarily change it. But if by some magic you could see its state without measuring it, this is a good approximation. Note that there are other shapes that the cloud of the hydrogen atom could take as well, depending on the energy level and the quantum state of the electron. But here are actual images of a hydrogen atom taken by an international team of researchers in 2013. So this is definitive proof that our 3D model is likely correct. Now, given what I just said, how can a photograph like this be taken? Well, this is not a direct image. If you read the paper, you'll find that it's a composite image based on the trajectory of electrons emitted by hundreds of hydrogen atoms after they're excited by lasers. So now we can answer our original two questions. First, why doesn't the electron just fall to the proton in the nucleus if it is attracted to it? After all, if you drop a meteor directly onto the Earth with no angular momentum, it will hit the Earth with a colossal amount of energy, enough to kill all the dinosaurs like 65 million years ago. But when it comes to the atom, even if you dropped an electron with no angular momentum directly onto a proton, the electron will not fall and hit the proton. Why? Because if it did, it would violate the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, because both delta x and delta p in the equation would be zero, and that can't be. What happens is there will always be a balance between the position and momentum of the electron such that the uncertainty principle is obeyed. What happens is the electron forms a cloud around the proton, even if you dropped it. You might say, okay, I get that. But if it's a cloud, why can't I squeeze two atoms together? We have to go to a chart which shows the energy of the electron as a function of distance from the nucleus. The electron prefers to be in the lowest energy state, which is at a distance of 0.529 times 10 to the negative 10 meters from the nucleus. In order to squeeze atoms to a smaller size, we have to increase the energy of the electron. This requires the electron to go to a higher energy state. When you consider that there are quadrillions of atoms in any object that we can see, for example, a grain of sand has about 10 to the 18 atoms, the cumulative amount of energy is humongous. Squeezing two objects together requires energies on the order of a small atomic bomb. And this is the reason we have solid objects that we can hold in our hand without our hand being able to squeeze them to nothing. And why we don't sink when we stand on solid ground. So while quantum mechanics results in some very mysterious phenomenon that we have a hard time explaining, like the double slit experiment or entanglement, it also gives us a deeper, more complete picture of reality as it probably is. While you might feel uncomfortable with quantum mechanics because it is unintuitive in nature, remember that nature has no obligation to be intuitive or understood by us conceited hairless apes who think we deserve to know the deepest secrets of the universe. Quantum mechanics is ultimately the root of reality. And if you wanna get a deeper understanding of this fascinating subject, one of the best classes is offered at Brilliant called Quantum Objects. It consists of 15 interactive lessons on various quantum physics concepts. Before you know it, you'll be solving problems like Bohr and Rutherford had to do. Learning science by solving problems and working on puzzles is, in my opinion, the best way to master a subject. And at Brilliant, today's sponsor, you can do just that. It's a problem-solving website and app that allows you to go deeper and further into the world of physics and other science subjects than any video or article ever can. If you want to support this channel and explore science deeper, head on over to brilliant.org forward slash Arvinash to sign up for free. And the first 200 visitors will even get 20% off their subscription. Check it out. I think you'll be impressed. I'd like to thank my generous supporters on Patreon and YouTube. If you enjoy my videos, consider joining them. Or check out some of our other videos. I will see you in the next video, my friend.